Hello, welcome to the workshop, Infections After Transplant. My name is Lynn Spina, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jennifer Cuellar Rodriguez. Dr. Cuellar Rodriguez is the director of the Transplant Infectious Diseases Consult Service at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease in Bethesda, Maryland. She works closely with various national institutes of health to implement, to implement allogeneic transplant and gene and cellular therapy protocols. In addition to clinical care, she provides educational support not only for oncology and transplant fellows, but also for mid-level providers and is an active member of the committees that develop institutional guidelines for the prevention and management of infections and cellular therapies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cuellar Rodriguez. Thank you for that kind introduction and the invitation to be part of the symposium. Um, as was already mentioned, I'm gonna be discussing infections in transplantation and more importantly, how what things we can do to decrease the risk of acquiring this infection. I have nothing to disclose. These are the specific topics I want to discuss today. The pre-transplant evaluation, when infections happen after transplantation, who is at increased risk of infection, and again, more importantly, how to prevent this infection. We know that transplantation in general is associated with an increased risk of acquiring infections. In the pre-transplant evaluation, we're trying to understand an individual's specific risk for getting infections and make the transplant safer for them. We know we're, um, the world is full of microbes and a patient may have been exposed to certain microbes that can cause problems as we proceed to transplantation. Therefore, we will ask about specific potential situations that make that individual the individual's risk of infection higher. So we'll ask about travel, hobbies, activities. Uh, we'll ask about particular gastronomic preferences that have been associated with difficult to treat infections. We will ask about your pets or animal exposures. And again, most of these uh, questions, it's not because we're nosy, we just want to understand what your risk of getting different infections is as you go through transplantation. We will also try to identify any active infections that you have before the transplant, give you treatment, and if it's possible, cure them. If this is not possible, at least have them under control before proceeding to transplantation. Because we will be using many antimicrobials as we proceed to transplantation, we will also ask about drug allergies. Just like, um, just like the interview part of this, evaluation, we will also order blood tests and imaging tests. Again, many of these tests are designed to um, understand which organisms you may have been exposed to and not know about it uh, before going to the transplant. For example, let's take cytomegalovirus or CMV. This is a virus that most adults have been exposed to either during their childhood or adolescence. In the United States, between 50 to 70% of all adults have been infected with CMV. And CMV is one of those viruses that once you get infected, you're always infected. But we don't get sick from it because our immune system prevents this from happening. However, uh, when our immune system is weakened or not working properly, mostly as a result of the chemotherapy or the drugs that are used to prevent graft versus host disease in transplantation, this type of microorganisms see an opportunity to cause disease. We actually call them opportunistic infections. So we'll try to identify many of these prior infections that you likely won't be aware of. We'll look for other specific infections that you may have encountered because of specific um, exposures. For example, if you come from a country where there's a lot of tuberculosis, we'll make a point of making sure you don't have uh, or have not had any contact with tuberculosis throughout your lifetime. 
but not only uh, the microorganisms were, that you have been exposed to increase your risk of infection. The risk of infection varies significantly with the type of transplant you are receiving. The specific diseases that prompted that transplant, and if you're an allogeneic uh, transplant recipient, also the type of donor we find for you. We will try to adjust all these prevention measures accordingly to all these risk um, scenarios. If you had many infections uh, during the chemotherapies prior to going to transplantation, you're more likely uh, to get other uh, infections after transplant. And when do infections happen after transplantation? So is it that once I'm transplanted, I'm always um, at risk of infection? Well, we are all at risk of infection, but certainly the risk for transplant recipients is higher. And, but the risk is not the same throughout time. So we know infections are most common early on after the transplant, and this risk decreases over time. This graph shows the number of infections in different time periods. So the first two graphs on the left side correspond to the time between the infusion of the cells until three months after transplantation, or day 100. This is a period of risk that is significantly higher independently of what type of transplant you had. Everyone in, is at risk in this time period and is at greater, greater risk. If we look at the next two bars, that's the time point between three and six months after transplantation. Our risk is still significant at that time point, but is less so than the first three months after transplant. If we look at the next six months after transplantation, that is to say between six and one year after transplant, we see that the risk is still there, but is again lower than the six months prior. And once we pass the first and two years after transplantation, our risk decreases significantly if everything went well, meaning I don't have recurrence of my disease or I do not have graft versus host disease and I am no longer receiving any immune suppression. However, if we compare this um, number of infections is still higher than someone that has never received an, uh, a transplant through their lifetime. To prevent infections and to treat them very early, as doctors, it's, it's helpful for us to think of, of the periods of increased risk of infections as three big groups. So we, the first uh, risk period is the time before engraftment, meaning after the infusion of the cells and before those cells come back. The next period of time is between the recovery of those cells until day 100. And the last period of time, or late after engraftment, is after day 100. So in the first period of time, again, prior to the recovery of all those blood cells, our, all our counts are expected to be low. So the red cells, the platelets, the white blood cell counts. Uh, the white blood cell counts are also called leukocytes. And these are the ones that we infectious disease doctors pay more attention to. And the two specific subsets of, of leukocytes that we focus uh, more importantly to design our interventions to prevent infections are the neutrophils and the lymphocytes. And why do infections happen so often at this period of time? Um, so at this period of time, you will have, you most likely be in the hospital or visiting the hospital very, very often. Um, usually, uh, you'll have all the side effects um, from the chemotherapy happening to you, like mucositis, which is destruction of the lining of all the, of the barrier from your oral mucosa, from your mouth, uh, your intestinal tract all the way to your anus. We have a lot of bacteria that lives in our mouth and our intestines. And if we disrupt this barrier, if we destroy this barrier with the chemotherapy and our neutrophils, which are the ones that um, control bacterial infections, meaning infections caused by bacteria, then this bacteria that normally lives in our mouth and our gut can go into our blood and cause 
disease. This is why when your counts are very, very low, when you're neutropenic, we will start antibiotics very, very quickly if you develop a fever. We'll likely also get blood cultures, um, and we worry about this scenario. So if you're at home and have your counts are, are low, you know you're neutropenic, it is extremely important that you seek care very quickly, even if the fever seems mild. Other infections that we can see in this time point are infections from the lines of the catheter or the catheters. We can have pneumonias or colitis. The second period of time starts right after those neutrophils start to come back or neutrophil engraftment. This period of time until day 100, we're, especially if you have had an allogeneic stem cell transplant, we're trying to prevent graft-versus-host disease. The, so the immune suppression is still significant in this time point, and the lymphocytes, which are the ones that usually are protected uh, from viruses and some parasites and some fungi, are still very, very low. So opportunistic infections, such as CMV, can happen in this time period. We'll give you medicines to prevent this infection. Finally, once um, the, cell, the cells start to recover, all the other cells, not only the neutrophils, but also the lymphocytes, then our immune system is more prepared to start dealing with infections. Uh, if so patients at this time point can be divided into large group of patients. Patients that are autologous transplant recipients and that have had good recovery of their cells and control of their disease, the one that, um, that made the transplant necessary, and those allogeneic stem cell transplant recipients that never developed graft or cell disease and that also have good control of their disease. These patients usually are no longer on immune suppressants or the immune suppressants are starting to be decreased significantly. Um, we're starting to be transfusion independent and sparing the visits to the hospital. So we're now more in the community and not as much in the hospital. This group of patients now get exposed more to respiratory viruses, gastrointestinal viruses that children can, can take home or infections associated to the food and the water. The other group of patients is those that either uh, their disease came back or have graft versus host disease, therefore are still on significant immune suppressants or still receiving chemotherapy. These patients are at increased risk of infection and it's like the entire period of time it's still there, and you still need to be protected against all these opportunistic infections. So now we know they happen after transplant. What can we do to prevent these infections? There are three main strategies that we use to prevent infections. We'll use some medicines, we'll recommend some vaccines, and we'll suggest lifestyle modifications. Antimicrobial prophylaxis. These are medicines uh, like antibiotics, antifungals, or, or antivirals that are used to prevent infections caused by bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Some of these infections will be continued even a few months after all immune suppression has been stopped. So these may be the last medicines that you would require after a transplant. If you're having difficulty taking your medicines, talk to your doctor. Because sometimes these medicines are, because we know that these medicines are used to prevent infections, sometimes, especially if we're having a hard time tolerating so many meds, it seems easy to just discontinue these medicines or start skipping doses. Please let us work with you. Um, you know, if, if we know you're having trouble with a specific medicine, there may be alternatives to that or there may be alternative schedules that are easier to tolerate. Let us uh, work with you in getting all those medicines um, that you require. Vaccination. Vaccines train our immune system to fight infections. And after transplant, our immune system loses most of the knowledge or memory that has accumulated through a lifetime on how to best fight common infections. Therefore, 
after transplant, we need to be revaccinated as if we were small children. Vaccination typically starts around three or six months after transplantation. However, there are some vaccines that may be harmful for us specifically during the first two years after transplantation. These are vaccines that are made of live um, debilitated viruses. Always discuss with your doctor um, which vaccines you're supposed to receive and can receive. This is a sample schedule of when vaccines would be given after transplantation. Each center may have a slight variation of this schedule, and depending on what time point or what transplant you receive, some of this may or may not be recommended. However, the idea is that many of these ones that are in a white um, background can be given very early on after transplantation, starting between three and six months after transplant. The ones that are on an orange background, so like the measles vaccine, are some of the examples of live virus vaccines that should not be given to any transplant recipient during the first two years after transplantation. This is when the time point when we consider that your immune system is now ready to handle those debilitated viruses, assuming you are not on any immune suppression. The third intervention that we will suggest is uh, lifestyle modifications. And remember, the objective of transplantation is yes, to restore health, but also the quality of life. And these lifestyle modifications are not meant to be so restrictive that the quality of life is poor. The closer you are to the transplant, the more strict we suggest you are re regarding this uh, recommendation. Also keep in mind that as an infectious disease doctor, I'm going to recommend this same um, lifestyle modifications to anyone that's trying to prevent the infection. It's all about trying to de reduce the risk. If you're in significant immune suppression because you have graft versus host disease or, again, are very early after transplant, we'll suggest that you're very good about following all these um, recommendations. I'm going to try to discuss all of these scenarios except for safe sex um, because it is my understanding that is a t there is a talk on reproductive health, but I do want to mention that still safe sex um, includes using uh, some type of barrier like a condom to prevent sexually transmitted diseases. So now let's discuss food safety. Transplant recipients and their families should pay particular attention to any local recommendations regarding um, outbreaks. Subscribe to your health department, uh, state department, um, state health department email alerts, or make it a habit to review their websites frequently, or the CDC websites. These are sites that are usually up to date on what current recommendations are. This graph actually comes from the CDC website, which is down here, and you can. I, I understand you have access to these slides, so you can go to this website at any time. Some of the recommendations are always wash your hands when you're going to prepare food. Also, disinfect and wash the surface where you're going to prepare food. Germs survive in many, many places for a prolonged period of time. Use separate cutting boards uh, for raw meat or poultry and seafood. These can spread bacteria to ready-to-use foods, so it's important to have them separate. Ensure there is an internal temperature is high enough to kill germs and keep you safe. Again, this website um, has specific suggestions to the different temperatures the different types of meats should be cooked to. It's different uh, what the internal temperature that needs to be reached from uh, pork or turkey than it is for fish. Again, it's important to make sure it's fully cooked to kill those germs. Finally, bacteria can um, multiply very quickly at air, at air temperature. Therefore, if you're coming from the supermarket, uh, refrigerate your food promptly. Avoid rare or raw undercooked meat, poultry, or fish. Raw oysters and clam have bacteria that can progress extremely quickly in immunosuppressed individuals, and they may not give you time to get to the hospital in time to get treated. 
Avoid uncooked deli meats, especially during the first year after transplant, even if they're labeled as ready to use. We suggest you cook them or microwave them before ingesting them. Avoid unpasteurized dairy products, such as milk or cheese. Some examples of cheeses that tend to be prepared with unpasteurized milk are brie, camembert, blue cheese, queso fresco, um, and in the United States, it is required that dairy products that are produced from pasteurized dairies are labeled as such. So make sure to read the label that this is, includes un, uh, pasteurized milk or, or from cow or, or goats. Avoid raw eggs. Some dressings or sauces, such as Caesar salad and hollandaise sauce, can have raw egg on it. So make sure to avoid those. Always wash vegetables or products, even when the bags are labeled as pre-washed or ready to eat. There have been several, there have been several outbreaks related to this um, to this product. Water safety. Avoid well water. However, if your water supply is from a well, have it tested yearly. If you must use well water, please boil the water that is going to be used for drinking or brushing your tree. You can also use bottled water as a safer alternative. Listen for announcements from local officials about water safety if you have um, uh, city water. And try to avoid ice, especially during travel. Recreational activities. Do not drink directly from lakes or rivers. In general, avoid swallowing water during swimming. And avoid swimming in areas that could be contaminated with human or animal waste, like river, lakes, or uh, public pools that are um, extremely crowded. Follow the signs. If there is a no swimming sign, there is a reason for that. The, 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 the local instructions usually um, suggest there may be a, con, uh, a dangerous uh, or harmful parasite for which we do not have uh, any good treatment or bacteria or toxic substances. If during uh, contact with water there is an abrasion or cut that occurs, clean it thoroughly with clean, uncontaminated water, meaning drinking water, and seek care. Let's move on to pets. Pets are wonderful and can have many emotional benefits for transplant recipients, but they can also carry significant amounts of bacteria or parasites that can be harmful to us, in particular if our immune system is not fully working. Avoid getting a new pet the first 12 months after transplantation. If you already have a pet prior to the transplant, make sure they're up to date in all of their vaccines. Make sure he visits the vet regularly and is staying healthy. Ideally, avoid cleaning litter boxes or handling feces. If avoiding this task is not possible, maybe because uh, of an occupational exposure, you're a veterinarian yourself, uh, make sure to wear gloves and masks. Avoid feeding your pets raw meat or poultry. They can also get sick from uh, from this product and they are more likely to transmit it to you if they're having diarrhea or vomiting. So noses are infections that are transmitted to humans by contact with animals. And there are many, many zoonoses that we infectious disease doctors think about. In general, we suggest avoiding exotic pets such as reptiles and amphibians. These are associated with a very high risk of getting typhoid fever or salmonella. Birds and bat droppings are associated with fungal infections, infections that can go to your brain, such as like cryptococcosis or to many other organs like histoplasmosis. Rodents and rats have been associated with viruses that can cause brain infection, and there had been outbreaks that had led to death of transplant recipients. In general, anyone should avoid having contact with wild animals, bats, or raccoons that may harbor rabies. Fish tanks. Cleaning of fish tanks may be dangerous to transplant recipients. Even though anyone could get infected with uh, some type of bacteria that are difficult to treat called Mycobacterium marinum, this bacteria 
in transplant recipients may go to many organs and may be very difficult to treat. Cats and dogs have uh, bacteria or parasites in their mouth that can be easily transmitted to humans. Always consult your doctor when a bite or an open wound occurs after contact with a pet. They might want to prescribe you an antibiotic and make sure to clean the area with clean water and soap before you get to the doctor. Now moving on to environmental safety. Outdoor activities have many health benefits for transplant recipients. However, we do not want you to t we, we do want you to take some precautions when doing outdoor activities, including gardening, yard work. We would like to use to avoid hunting or fishing, especially during the first year after transplantation, or doing activities in caves or wooded areas. If you must do these activities, wear protective gear. For example, for gardening, we suggest wearing gloves and long sleeves protective shoes and long pants. Avoid going barefoot outside. Limit your exposure to dirt or dust. If this cannot be avoided, wear a mask. Now let's move on to travel safety. We want you to resume your life as normal as possible and travel can be accomplished safely after transplantation but it's usually better if planned in advance. So contact your transplant team prior to transplant. Make sure they're in agreement that you're ready to resume travel. They're, they may want you to avoid certain areas where there are current outbreaks or there's just a higher risk of exposure to certain infections like malaria or tuberculosis. Also make sure to be up to date in all of your vaccines and check all vaccine requirements for um, different travel destinations. There may be some specific vaccine requirements that may not be safe for you, depending on what time point you are after a transplant. So you need to have this discussion um, with your transplant team. Make sure to bring a summary of your medical history and a list of all your current me medications to your travel. Make sure to take extra doses of all the medicines in case your travel plans change uh, unexpectedly. You don't want to run out of medicine in a place where you don't know that you'll have access to them. The CDC has a website where you can go in and check all um, the destinations and specific requirements for them. Diarrhea. Diarrhea during travel is a very common problem for anyone traveling, um, but immunosuppressed individuals can get sicker from um, these infections. Food and water safety recommendations are even more important during travel. And you can also talk to your doctor about having an antibiotic prescription for your travel to taking it in case you develop diarrhea. It's also a good idea to locate health or transplant clinics uh, before you travel in case you developed a minor illness or you have a more severe complication that more expertise are required, knowing where a transplant clinic is, is important. This is a sample where the um, uh, CDC website is, where you can go in and put in the information where you're traveling. You put it uh, here and where are you going. Then uh, it'll list all the vaccines are, that are recommended for that specific destination and maybe some medicines that are recommended for the specific destination that you're looking at. And then it'll give you some examples of diseases for which you cannot be vaccinated, but there are certain um, uh, lifestyle measures that can help you keep yourself safe. So may say avoid contaminated water and soil, avoid uh, bug bites, et cetera. So depending on what the destination is, the specific recommendation uh, for that area. So this is very useful and anyone can access it. We as doctors, when you tell us we're gonna, I'm gonna go to um, a specific destination, we always access a similar website where we'll get current recommendations um, about outbreaks or travel. Finally, I wanna discuss respiratory viral infections. Respiratory viral infections are the most common infections once patients return to the community. And they can be 
uh, prevented uh, by frequent hand washing, either with soap or in water or an alcohol-based gel hand sanitizer. Minimize contact with people that are visibly coughing, sneezing, having a runny nose, red eyes, a rash, or a fever. If you can't avoid contact with these people, you know, wear a protective, well-fitting, high-quality mask. Uh, anytime you're in a crowded environment, anytime you see someone having um, any of these symptoms, and I also like to mention anytime you're visiting an emergency department or even a hospital. Hospitals, um, usually people that are sick visit hospitals. And these are the types of infections that you can acquire just by sitting next to someone. So keeping ourselves safe is the best way to proceed. Finally, I want to discuss I, I want to uh, finalize by, by saying that infections are a common complication after transplant. Even if we do everything we're supposed to be doing, they can still happen. But prevention works by reducing the number of infections that we'll get after transplantation. And the farther, farther away we move from transplant, the lower the risk. Again, these reduction measures are medicines, vaccinations, and lifestyle modifications. They work. But if you're, travel, you're having trouble adhering to a particular recommendation, talk to your doctor. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cuellar Rodriguez, for your excellent presentation. We'll now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question for the doctor, please use the chat box on the left side of the screen to submit your question. We will answer as many questions as possible. So our first question is, I'm dealing with shingles and recurrences. Is getting Shingrix effective after transplant and recommended? Yes, so Shingrix um, is a vaccine to prevent uh, shingles or, or herpes saucer reactivation and actually is a very good vaccine in that it is uh, a safer vaccine because it's um, the prior version of the shingles preventive vaccine used a live debilitated virus. But this one, Shingrix specifically, is a recombinant vaccine that does not have any live virus in it. So it's considered safe in transplant recipients and can be administered earlier on before we need to, we used to wait until at least two years after transplantation to be able to give um, shingles vaccine. But Shingrix, again, can be given uh, earlier on and it's safe. How effective it is um, in transplant recipients is less well studied. In older adults that frequently get um, herpes saucer reactivation, it was very effective. But we know that uh, transplant recipients tend to respond less well to vaccines, so they don't mount as good of a response. And because this is a newer vaccine, we don't have necessarily all the information to tell you how protective this will be. But it's certainly something we recommend patients get, especially if they're already dealing with shingles. Thank you. The next question this person asks, is the use of nasal rinses and also gargling a good defense against lowering the viral load of viruses and, bac and bacteria in the throat, nasal passages, and thereby the lungs? Would the rinses keep you from having a more severe case of disease, cold, flu, COVID? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I can say that it lowers the viral load of viruses or the load of bacteria in the throat or or the nasal uh, mucosa. Um, you know, certainly it washes it out uh, at that moment, uh, but certainly it maintains the mucosa moist. And viruses and bacteria usually get into the respiratory tract when the when our mucosa is very dry and there is disruption of the of this uh, mucosal barrier so in that sense it can decrease the risk of getting an infection 
if we have a moist mucosal uh, nasal mucosa. So it's, it is recommended um, for that reason. Thank you. Does the vaccine schedule you provide also cover post CAR T cell therapy? If not, can you address the difference? Um, the the vaccine schedule that I showed. Um, can you repeat the question? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know you don't. Yes, have access. I, I believe it. Yeah, I believe it's relating to your slide. Does the vaccine schedule you provide also okay, okay, yeah. cover post CAR T? Yeah. So again, um, that was just a sample chart of what may be done um, in your center, and these are center specific. So there are some general recommendations, but they may be adjusted at each center. Um, and usually, um, post CAR T cell therapy, depending on what type of CAR T cells um, you receive and what uh, lymphocytic um, lymphodepleting therapy you use, they use as part of the therapy, they may or may not recommend all vaccines. So I don't think it's as well established uh, for CAR T cell therapy, um, but certainly you may definitely benefit from some of them, but not necessarily all of them. Again, it depends a lot on what disease uh, and what the CAR T cells were targeted for. So having a discussion with your doctor is very important. Thank you. That's good direction. Do you see many infections from insect bites among immunocompromised stem cell transplant survivors? Well, because I live in Maryland, um, we don't see as many infections. But um, in areas that are more uh, tropical, there are several diseases that can be severe and they're transmitted through infections. So, for example, malaria. And they, this can be um, severe presentations in transplant recipients. Um, so there are many mosquito-associated um, infections. Um, one of them in the U.S., for example, is um, West Nile virus. Um, I can't say we see a lot of it, but certainly it's here. Uh, and as there's climate change and the weather gets hotter in places where before it wasn't as hot, we're starting to see some of those um, infections that are uh, southern um, from the U.S. start to, to, to show up. So I think over time we're going to see more and more cases of of diseases that are transmitted through mosquito bites, um, but not certainly not a lot. However, I would still say that you know the recommendation is that um, you can wear uh, protective gear if you are able to, so it's not you know long sleeves or or long pants or uh, or or and. Um, um, mosquito repellent with DET, usually that's very effective in decreasing the probability of getting bitten by, by mosquitoes and transmitting disease. Thank you. The next person asks, post-transplant, what do you recommend to protect ourselves from infection when meeting friends, attending events, etc.? For example, should we always be wearing a mask both early days after transplant and later after receiving vaccines. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. And and again, I I as I you know, like I said in my presentation, I think it's one of those things of decreasing the risk of getting an infection. So definitely early after transplant, I would recommend that if you are meeting people that, you know, you don't know for sure they're healthy and you know there the numbers of of uh, respiratory viruses around are high so in the flu season or covid it's starting to pick up again or um, some other respiratory viruses it's wiser to always use uh, a mask later on with time um you know you may still uh, if you definitively do not want to get infected the best way to avoid it is doing that 
but it may be uncomfortable or you don't want to do it anymore. And if you're much later after transplant, you know, farther out than two years after transplant, you're getting, you've got your vaccines, you're much more protected, you're, you're not an immune suppressant. Again, you can still get sick um, from these viruses, but the probability that you'll get very sick from these viruses will be lower. So it's all about risk reduction. So, um, you know, there may be one meeting that there's a lot of people that you have no idea how they are. Maybe even if you're far away from transplant, um, I, you still want to use the mask. Um, but maybe it's a smaller gathering with, you know, some close friends and family, then you might want to avoid it. Or, you know, if uh, if it's outside it's much safer than if it's outside than inside so again all these recommendations that we heard from covid i think still apply um, in the sense that our risk reduction measures so we're always at risk of getting an infection any of us is any of us can get the flu any of us can get covid even if you've been transplanted or not transplanted um, and the farther away you are the lower the risk assuming you're not immunosuppressant um but but um, again, it's, it's making good choices. Thank you. And this is an extension of that. Um, so what you just answered would apply to a lot of the question, but the question is a little different, so I'm going to ask it. At what point are transplant recipients safe to travel by plane, and what is your opinion of cruises? Yeah. Um, so travel by plane is a very broad question also uh, because, um, you know, it's a short ride. How important is the travel? So I, I would say in general, we look at the entire picture, and that's why having that discussion with the doctor is, is extremely important. But again, the closer you are to the transplant, you're going to be in this closed environment. And, you know, usually the plane is not as much of a deal as, like, the lines going into the plane. Um but in, in a crowded environment, uh, you are significantly more at risk. So the first six months are the hardest, the hardest part, but the first year. And then we only consider you sort of fit to handle debilitated viruses, which is not what you would acquire um, directly after two months, two years after transplant. So again, the farther you get out, the lesser the risk and how important this travel is, um, you know, for your overall well-being is, is, is also something to consider. Um, regarding cruises, I think in general, as an infectious disease doctor, I don't like it that much um, because if you have an outbreak, you know, you're stuck in the middle of the ocean and it can take many days before you can reach a medical clinic. But again, it's all it's, it's 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 all about you know I've been looking forward to this um, cruise uh, you know it was like our 50th anniversary gift and that's and we've been looking to that well you know and, and I'm farther out already I've gotten all my vaccines well you know maybe it's a good time to do it because that's very important also so all about uh, reducing the risk we can never completely avoid risk. Okay. Switching gears, what is the current recommendation for COVID revaccination after transplant using the bivalent vaccine? If the first injection is given at six months, when would the second one be given? How many should be given? So if you, I'm, I'm going to refer all of you um, for any specific COVID vaccine questions, um, the recommendations were re were updated actually on May 1st, and there's a, a, an entire section on immunocompromised individuals, which includes um, stem cell transplant recipients, CAR T cells or, or cellular therapies, and, and, and other, um, other immunosuppressed uh, patients. So that's the first uh, referral that, that I think it's important to get. Uh, we'll send that link to the group. But um, so if you've never been vaccinated, there are three doses. Um, if you've gotten one of the one of the doses, depending on whether you got Moderna or Pfizer, would be 
at least four weeks apart or three weeks if it was a Pfizer um, vaccine. Again, it, this things may start to um, vary uh, with the different um, doses of the vaccines that you have gotten. If you, the specific question, I think it said six, um, got the six months bivalent, the first dose. So assuming it was Pfizer, it would be at least eight weeks um, for the next dose. And then if, if it was Moderna, I think those two would be four weeks. Again, I, I look it up because I can't keep track of that um, specifically. And they also mentioned whether you had received one of the non-mRNA vaccines, you know, what should I do now and how to, how to recommend. But in general, they're no longer recommending the monovalent vaccine at all. They're only the bivalent. And the entire vaccination schedule should be um, with the bivalent vaccines. And they're usually three doses that are the initial recommendation. And I know that they're going to have um, booster recommendations uh, coming up, just like we do with um, the flu vaccine. Okay. I am two years out of stem cell transplant for B cell ALL. I am trying to get off tacrolimus for the third time. When I do, after a short while, GVHD crops up. What percentage of patients take so long to get off tacrolimus? I was planning on having my childhood immunization at about one year, but I can't until I get off this medication. This keeps me pretty isolated due to risk of infection. When can I get back to the world again? Yeah, I, I think um, the specific um, number of percentage of people that uh, cannot uh, get their immune suppression discontinued because of chronic graft versus or disease would be better directed to the transplanters. I'm an infectious disease doctor, so I don't want to uh, give um, misleading information, um, and and also, you know, there may be some vaccines that you can get even if you're maintained on tacrolimus. So remember, solid organ transplant recipients. So those that get transplants from kidneys and 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 livers and lungs, they are maintained on immune suppression for the rest of their lives, and that does not mean that. They have to be completely um, isolated and that no vaccines can be given. Vaccines, some vaccines are safe to give starting three months or six months after transplantation. So having that discussion and, you know, those concerns um, with your medical team are important. You know, what are the things that I can do right now to uh, stop feeling this way and being so isolated? Okay, thank you. How risky is hot tub use? How risky are public hot spring resorts? Yeah, um, hot springs um, or hot tubs have been associated with several infections, um, starting with uh, pseudomonas infection and certain um, mycobacteria infection, which are difficult to treat bacteria that um, are similar to um, tuberculosis bacteria. Um, so, in general, they're not that safe, and we would um, recommend that you avoid them. Now, um, again, you know, if your counts are very low, we'll say no, definitively you cannot do this. Your count, you're, you're too much of a risk uh, because this is all about a balance between the things you can do and the risk you're taking by doing them. Um, you know, we'll, if, if counts are low or immunosuppression is very high, um, we'll likely say, uh, no, this is a no-no. You know, over time, again, the, the, the risk is still going to be there. Um, it's just that it decreases. And resorts, I, it's individual how um, well-maintained they are maintained or not, but I would say that even in places that um, there's a lot of care for maintaining things clean. You know, these bacteria just, they stay in the tubing and, you know, tolerate high temperatures. So it's not because they don't clean the facilities. It's just that they're hard to kill. 
Um, so the risk is still there, um, and it's all about, you know, how close I am to the transplant and how likely it is that I will actually acquire this infection. So this um, other type of bacteria, you know, you have to be pretty immune suppressed to get it in your system and go to many places. Um, if not, it'll likely be just a local infection. But um, so depending when you are in your transplant, there's always going to be risk. Um, very close to your transplant or when your count are very low, we'll definitively say um, the risk is way too high and you should definitely not do it. Thank you. How much is risk of infection increased with GVHD? So um, significant, um, and it depends on whether it's an acute episode of graft versus host disease or GVHD. You know, it's something that um, they start you on steroids, but it's controlled very quickly versus someone that develops chronic graft versus host disease that it's difficult to control or graft versus host disease that is refractory, that it's acute, but, it's, but it does not respond to the um, initial immune suppression. So um, graft versus host disease and infections tend to happen simultaneously because of that reason. However, if you have a short episode of graft versus host disease that responds quickly to the treatment, your risk is significantly higher than, again, you needed several medicines to control graft versus host disease um, or to keep it at bay, uh, you need to be kept on immune suppressants for a prolonged period of time, they usually increase significantly the risk of infection over time. And some Thank of those you. opportunistic infections that I mentioned during the talk, so again, they use that opportunity that you're kept on those treatments to come and cause trouble. Mm -hmm. All right, and the next person asks, what prevention measures can be taken against contacting mumps, measles, and rubella if the vaccine cannot be given for two years post-transplant? So usually the recommendation would be to avoid anyone that is visibly sick. That is the first thing to do, to avoid. Um, visiting places where there are current outbreaks of measles is important. Uh, avoiding Avoiding visiting places where there are current um, outbreaks of measles is, is an important measure. Um, if, however, you live in a place where there is a current outbreak of measles, for example, uh, then your doctors may want to test how your immune system is doing at that particular time point, even if it's not the two years, and try to decide if the risk of giving you the vaccine is lower or higher than um, being exposed because there are so many people around that are sick. So, in, you know, the recommendation in general is to avoid it, um, but other studies have looked that, you know, if you are in the middle of an outbreak and the probability that you come out, come in contact with the virus just by being outside, um, is so high that, you know, that your risk of getting primary measles, it, this is not a debilitated virus. So we know at least that the virus in, in the vaccine is debilitated and it can be harmful, but maybe it's not as much as the primary disease. So the way to uh, avoid it is avoiding go, traveling to places where there are current outbreaks, uh, obviously avoiding anyone that has uh, a current illness, a rash or um, fever uh, is, is the way to maintain ourselves um, as healthy as possible. And if the outbreak is within the place where we live, then have a serious discussion with um, your care providers of whether you are able to receive that vaccine, even if it's earlier than the two-year mark. Thank you. Prior to major surgery, should someone on 10 milligrams prednisone for many years be tapered down on their prednisone to reduce risk of infection and possibly improve healing? And if so, how long, how low a dose should be tapered off to? 
Yeah, someone that has been on um, steroids for a prolonged period of time, they're at risk of uh, developing something that's called adrenal insufficiency. The adrenals are uh, an organ that produces our internal uh, steroids, so we always produce steroids ourselves. Uh, but when we are giving steroids uh, via medicine, because they give us a pill of prednisone, then our system kind of shuts down because it says, well, I don't need to produce it because you're giving it to me. Um, so anyone that has been on um, steroids for a prolonged period of time, they need to make sure that they don't have adrenal insufficiency before stopping uh, the steroids. Uh, surgery is a stress, so the reason our body produces a um, steroids, one of the reasons is to, as a response to stress to the organism, and um, it, they need to make sure we don't actually need it for the surgery itself. So again, having a proper evaluation of your adrenal uh, function before stopping it is, is uh, probably as important or more important than reducing the risk of infection and promoting healing. Thank you. And this will have to be the last question. Uh, we are coming close to the end of our time. So it relates to CAR T cell therapy. Why do I have to get all my infant vaccines after CAR T cell therapy? Um, so the lymphodepleting uh, therapy or the chemotherapy that is given prior to uh, giving the cells may, depending on what type of CAR T cells, be too strong and it's going to kill all the memory that um, all the immune system, your own immune system, that is unable to deal with your disease. And now they're going to give you the CAR T cells that are uh, directed to kill that um, disease. Not all CAR T cells um, treatments are the same. Um, but if they were suggested to you, it's likely the case that it's so strong, the immune suppression prior to the cells, that um, these um, protective cells from your own immune system will be um, gone and you'll need to be revaccinated to actually uh, recuperate that ability to fight those infections. Great. All right. On behalf of BMT Infinite and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Cuellar Rodriguez for her very helpful remarks and thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT Infinite if we can help you in any way and enjoy the rest of the symposium.